Hi friends, it's Miss Nikki here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay guys, I got some really great bedtime stories to share with you. I hope you're excited, they're gonna be wonderful. We're gonna start with this really fun one called Never Play Music Right Next to the Zoo. This one is written by John Lithgow and illustrated by Lisa Hernandez. Um, if you check this one out from the library, it comes with an audiobook version of the story with music and actually being read out loud by the author. Never play music right next to the zoo. There's a couple of raccoons. I saw one when I was camping a couple weeks ago. Here's our title page. Never play music right next to the zoo. Our author's name John Lithgow, illustrated by Lisa Hernandez. Oh, it's a baby elephant. How sweet. A little bird in a nest. Oh, that's adorable. All right, here we go. I went to a concert when I was a lad, no older than many of you. I sat with my sister, my mother, my dad at a band shell right next to the zoo. Wow, look at all those people waiting. Oh, there's a snake on a lamppost. The soft summer air was so balmy and sweet, and the program was running so long that I found myself falling asleep in my seat, despite all the music and song. That can't happen. When you're sleepy and it's warm and you're cozy, you can fall asleep. All at once, the conductor erupted with rage. A band of wild animals was storming the stage. Ah! Oh no! There's a lion and a snake. And there's those two raccoons from the beginning. Oh, poor conductor, knocked over. There's a tiger and an elephant. Oh my! Oh children, remember whatever you do, never play music right next to the zoo. They'll burst from their cages, each beast and each bird, desperate to play all the music they've heard. The lions and the elephants, the bears and the raccoons will steal away the trumpets, the flutes, and bassoons. Uh-oh. She doesn't look like she's going to give up her flute to that bear very easily, does she? No, she does not. Uh-oh. Replace the musicians and chase them away. Then they'll sit in the band shell and play. Oh no! <laughs> Someone's being smooshed by an elephant. But he does look very cute in his tiny hat. The monkeys played fiddle. The bison played bass. The percussions were manned by the camel. The yaks played the sax until red in the face. A surprisingly musical mammal. I like the yak. I like his sunglasses. The bonobo played oboe, the ferret the flute. The jackal attacked the bassoon. The hippo had chosen the tuba to toot by the light of the silvery moon.
Siberian tigers, Mongolian goats, a superabundance of bestial nose. Oh no, those wild animals. Oh, as the animal orchestra filled up the air with chaos, confusion, and clatter, the audience calmly continued to stare as if nothing at all was the matter. I trembled with terror suppressing a scream while my parents just sat there, enraptured. Oh, how I wished it was only a dream and those creatures were all safely recaptured. Look at them. They're just bebopping along with all the crazy animals at the, at the zoo playing their music. But since by the minute I'd grown less afraid, I decided to sit back and watch while they played. So there they are at the band show. And here's all the people watching them. There's our friend and his family, his mom and his dad. And there's Mr. Conductor. And that must be his sister, I think. And everyone's just listening to all the animals playing a concert. That would be silly and fun, but you know what? I would probably just sit and listen too. When could you ever have a chance to see that again? They finished and each put his instrument down, then bowed and descended the stage. Each shed his tuxedo or evening gown and hurried back home to his cage. Then each reminisced, so grateful and glad, so full of contentment and pride. My mother, meanwhile, strolled away with my dad, but my sister remained by my side. She tugged on my sweater and spoke in my ear. You better wake up or we're leaving you here. <laughs> oh, children, remember, whatever you may do, never play music right next to the zoo. They'll burst from their cages, each beast and each bird desperate to play all the music they've heard. No, never play music right next to the zoo and pay strict attention to rule number two. Bear it in mind for the rest of your days. fall asleep while the orchestra plays. Do you think maybe it was just a dream? Could maybe he have just had a dream? That's possible. All right, we're gonna go on with our next story. I've been reading a lot of these lately during our regular story times. I can't, I can't remember right now if I've read any recently during a, a bedtime story. But this is one of our Itty Bitty Bio series, and this Itty Bitty Bio is about a famous Native American woman whose name is hotly debated. While I was getting ready for story time tonight, I, um, I looked up how to pronounce this name right here. And for those of you who are good at spelling, you can help me with these letters. S A C a G A W E A. So 
So there has been a lot of debate on how her name is pronounced. So for ease tonight, I'm going to go with the one that I think is the most accepted pronunciation, Sakagawea. When I looked it up, that's what I saw. So Sakagawea, we're going to learn all about her life. Well, not all about it, but a little bit about it. I really love the jewelry that she wears. It's very special to her, but it's very beautiful to me. So as always, we have here our table of contents, like we have in our nonfiction stories. The first section is my story. Then we have our timeline, our glossary, and the index. My story. I was born near a river. I was named Bird Woman. My family was Native American. It's a beautiful river. That's probably not the exact river where she was born. We probably don't know exactly the place where she was born. I was taken from my family. I lived with another tribe. I married a fur trader. Two men named Lewis and Clark came to my village. They were explorers. They hired my husband to help them. What part of the world would you like to explore? Why? You know the best place to explore? Is your very own backyard. That's a great place to start. They wanted my help too. I agreed to join them. I brought my baby son with me. And that's an illustration of her carrying her baby on her back while she helped lead Lewis and Clark on an expedition across the United States. It's a long journey. I knew how to speak to my people. I could talk for Lewis and Clark. Along the way, we met my brother. He helped us get horses and a guide. I also helped by making clothes and shoes. I gathered food. I knew which plants we could eat. And that's a picture of the type of shoes that they might have worn, that she might have made. It's a similar example. Of course, it's hard to know exactly what they would have looked like. We don't have pictures from then. We went down rivers. We went across mountains. After months, we reached the ocean. I saw a beached whale. Oh, that's sad. What would you want to see at the ocean? I know some of my friends have been to the ocean before and they've seen amazing things there. When the trip was over, I went home. Lewis and Clark became famous for their work. And that's true. They came right here through Missouri. I died a few years later. Clark adopted my son. I helped Lewis and Clark explore the West. What would you like to ask me? I would want to ask her, was it really heavy carrying your baby on your back that whole time? It must have been very, very heavy and probably a little bit scary. I would be afraid I was going to fall. All right, so here we have our timeline. She was born in 1788. She met up with Lewis and Clark in 1804. And they went on their expedition in 1805. And then she died in 1812. She was a pretty young lady. 
and our glossary explorers. That's what Lewis and Clark were. They're people who discover places. Native American, one of the people who originally lived in America before Columbus and the other settlers came, or a relative of these people. Tribe, a large group of related people who live in the same area. And tribes generally uh, refer specifically to Native American peoples who lived here before this land was settled by travelers. All right, we have one more story to share. And this one I've been saving for last because it's a, it's a little bit long, but also because I just learned about this lady when we got this book. I'd never learned about her before. And I had only skimmed the book before I was getting ready for story time today. So I didn't really finish it. But I read it all the way already now. So I had looked at it before, I hadn't really read it all the way, and when I, um, when I finished reading the story, I read the author's note, and normally I don't share those, but I'm going to share that with you tonight at the end of this so I can tell you what I learned. Harlem's Little Blackbird, the story of Florence Mills, written by Renee Watson and illustrated by Christian Robinson. And Harlem is, um, is a place in New York City, I hesitate to call it a neighborhood because it's much larger than that. They call it a borough, I believe. All right, here's our title page, this beautiful illustration. I love the illustrations in this book. Harlem's Little Blackbird, written by Renee Watson illustrated by Christian Robinson and of course our publisher here. They called her Harlem's Little Blackbird. Her name was Florence Mills. She was born in 1896 and lived in a teeny tiny itsy bitsy house in Washington DC. A house so fragile it would shake whenever a thunderstorm came. Mother said, don't fear, and she would sway back and forth to the rain's rhythm, singing the same spirituals that had carried her family, family through slavery storms. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, Thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Mother's voice wrapped Florence like a warm blanket. Florence started singing too. The louder the thunder roared, the stronger she sang. Soon the storm faded to a damp drizzle, and then the drizzle disappeared. Her voice had chased the storm away. Florence thought, if my voice is powerful enough to stop the rain, what else can it do? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, I wanted to make sure that that was not stuck together. Ah, oh, they are stuck, see? I knew they were stuck. Here we go. It wasn't long before Florence found out. On the playground at school, she would sing and dance. Her friends would stop playing just to listen. Whenever music would play, Florence's hands got to waving, her hips got to shaking, her feet strutted and glided across the pavement. The cakewalk is what they called it. Everyone was cakewalking, but Florence did it best. Her feet were like wings fluttering in the air. Soon, Florence was cakewalking and singing in contests all over town. She won many medals. I like her bow. Florence had a hard time paying attention in school. Instead of listening to the teacher, she would stare out the window. 
The sky became her stage, and she was a star, singing and dancing for the world. But wishing wouldn't change the fact that she was just Florence Mills, the daughter of former slaves, living in a teeny tiny itsy bitsy house. Word danced around Washington about the little girl with the big talent. Florence was invited to perform at a fancy theater. The night before the show, she practiced her routine over and over. On the day of the show, when Florence and her friends arrived at the theater, nothing was what Florence had dreamed it would be. They can't come in, the manager said. He pointed to a sign that read, Whites Only. No Negroes in the audience. Florence used her voice to stand up for what was right. If they can't go in there, I'm staying out here, Florence said. And with her hands on her hips, and her head held high, she walked away. Wait, the manager yelled, but Florence kept on walking. He begged her to perform and snuck her friends in to see the show. That night, Florence performed her best routine. Everyone stood and clapped. Less than six years later, her family moved to New York City. Florence and her sisters became a singing and dancing trio, the Mills Sisters. They performed at Harlem's Lincoln Theater. In the summer, the Mills Sisters spent their days at Coney Island. Florence never got tired of going on rides and playing games at the arcades. But nothing was as fun as performing at the Surf Avenue Opera House. Reporters followed them everywhere, and there's one and there was one sister they adored the most, 16-year-old Florence. Come hear the woman who sings like a bird, and when she dances, it's as if she's flying. And she was. She flew from stage to stage all over the country, from the East Coast to the West Coast, until she landed at New York's 63rd Street Music Hall. It was 1921, and Florence won a role in Shuffle Along. The sold-out show introduced jazz to white audiences. Each night, Florence gave her best. Every part of her body danced. Her eyelashes fluttered, her fingers wiggled. She whirled around and boogied down. Night after night, she gave the audience a hand clapping, foot stomping good time. A very special thing was happening in Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance. All kinds of creative minds contributed to Harlem's cultural movement. Langston Hughes penned poetry, Duke Ellington composed jazz classics, and in play after play, Florence continued to mesmerize crowds. In From Dover Street to Dixie, she was so good, the cast was invited to London. Florence was excited to travel overseas. But not everyone welcomed her. When she boarded the ship, the white passengers refused to eat in the same dining room as Florence and her troop. When she arrived in London, many people threatened to boycott the show because they didn't want to see black performers on their stage. On opening night, Florence took a deep breath, opened her mouth and sang one note, and then another and another. The audience was amazed. It 
each night when Florence stepped on stage. The audience cheered before she even opened her mouth. She was an international star. And Florence thought, if my voice can take me around the world, what else can it do? After Florence sailed back to Harlem, Mr. Ziegfeld, an important Broadway manager, offered Florence a leading role. She would have been the first black woman to star in the Ziegfeld Follies. It was every performer's dream, but she turned it down. Instead, she chose to use her voice in shows that gave unknown black singers and actors a chance to perform on stage. Florence became the leading lady in Dixie in Broadway. One hundred lights shined on the marquee, flashing her name. The daughter of former slaves who grew up in a teeny tiny itsy bitsy house had made it. Florence wanted to use her voice for more than entertainment. In the show Blackbirds, she sang, I'm a little blackbird looking for a bluebird. It became her favorite song to perform, a cry for equal rights. Though I'm of a darker hue, I've a heart the same as you. For love I'm dying, my heart is crying. A wise old owl said, keep on trying. I'm a little blackbird looking for a bluebird too. The show was such a hit that Florence was invited to London again. This time she was wel welcomed by photographers and news reporters and she was invited to many parties. After her performances, Florence disguised herself so no one would recognize her. She went to hospitals to deliver flowers to patients, and she walked along the Thames River giving money and food to beggars. Florence kept giving and dancing and singing until she was too exhausted to perform anymore. She became very ill and returned to Harlem to receive treatment from her doctor but there was not much her doctor could do. And on November 1st, 1927, Florence's song came to an end. More than 150,000 mourners flooded the streets of Harlem to say goodbye. Letters, telegrams, and flowers were sent to the family from all over the world. People who had a lot and people who had a little. Politicians and entertainers, whites and blacks, gave tribute to Florence Mills. Even blackbirds came. Hundreds of them were seen hovering nearby. Florence's dream lives on in the singers and dancers who came after her. It lives on in the heart of every boy and girl from a teeny tiny itsy bitsy place who dreams of doing great, big, gigantic, enormous things. And so here's our author's note. And I told you guys I wanted to share because before I read the author's note on this book, I thought, oh, I want to go find a, a recording of Florence's voice and I want to hear her beautiful song. Florence's voice was never recorded and no films of her performances exist. So how do we know how great she was? The answers lie in the reaction her peers had to her. Florence was so great, Duke Ellington composed the song Black Beauty as a tribute to her. Iconic performers Lena Horne and Paul Robeson said she was one of the best. In 1925, Florence became the first black woman to be photographed for a full spread in Vanity Fair. When Blackbirds moved to London's Pavilion Theater, 
the Prince of Wales saw the show more than 20 times. But her talent wasn't all that made Florence great. What made her a remarkable woman was that she used her fame and fortune to help others. If you were a young child playing on the streets of Harlem or sitting on the soup of a brownstone, Florence might stop and give you candy. If you were a guest at an NAACP fundraising event, you might hear Florence as one of the featured performers. These are the things that made, beloved, that made Florence a beloved entertainer. Her talent, yes, but mostly her generosity and her faith. And that was the end of our story about Florence Mills. I love when I can read a picture book for the first time and learn something new that I never learned before, especially when it means that I'm learning about someone who really lived and they had a great story. I love that book. I hope you guys enjoyed all of our bedtime stories tonight. It is Thursday, so I'll see you guys again on Monday. Monday night, we'll be doing bedtime stories again right here at 7 o'clock. And then next Wednesday at 10.30, we'll be doing um, story time again, our Wednesday morning story time. So thank you guys so much for tuning in tonight. Have a great evening.